Thank you, Skip. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank all of you for, for coming to hear whatever it is that I'm going to say. And for all of your patronage along the way. I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about my life as a chef. Um, and how I viewed my, my work uh, and my place in life in New Orleans transition that I went through and, and leaving the state of Louisiana and coming to Arkansas uh, and why I believe that Arkansas is a really good place to do food today. I was had great exposure to culture and cuisine growing up in New Orleans. I was blessed to be in a place that was one of the world's richest uh, in, in cuisine and a sense of place, culture. Uh, let's see here. And I was exposed to a long history of a, of a well-developed cuisine. Uh, I was able to visit New Orleans' finest restaurants um, to see cooking um, at, a, at a very high level, an engaged type of cooking. And also, uh, I was blessed to have a great family uh, and a grandmother, uh, one of which, anyway, who um, to this day still prepared the best meals that I've ever tasted. And, you know, what's important about the the food of Louisiana, the culture of Louisiana, is that it is founded in soul. It, it came from people that, that settled in that area and brought with them long-standing traditions and techniques and, and celebration. And they responded to the environment that was sort of handed to them, and they made something new. And they made something that became today, and you know, this happened long ago, but one of the most recognized global cultures, one of the most defined and noticeable cuisines um, in the world. And as I was coming up, uh, I was, I saw something, I started cooking 20 years ago, uh, just about to the day. Uh, and what I saw happening around me was that my colleagues and mentors were kicking things up to notches unknown to mankind, which was fantastic because it brought an awareness and an interest and energized following that's essential. Uh, and I saw a lot of fusing going on, uh, which I think is probably also very important uh, with respect to the blending of, of multinational cultures. Uh, but what I also saw is that the foundation from which this was happening was being ignored. I saw, I felt that the gumbos and the etouffees that I was used to had sort of become thoughtless and one dimensional. And I developed a sense of responsibility and, and, a, and a sort of a personal mission to, to try and curate and preserve those things that, that made my identity and the identity of, of my home. Uh, <clears throat> I uh, learned to cook sort of on my own self-taught. I mean, the real lesson in cooking that I got was 
was in, you know, probably in college in Colorado on the telephone with my grandmother trying to write down a recipe for you know, one of her gravies or something. And um, you know, she didn't keep recipes, she just cooked. And I had to learn, you know, she'd say to put a bunch of this and a bunch of that or just a list of ingredients. And well, how do you, once you get there, it's like, well, how do you cut this? And you know, small, big, what do you put in in the pot first? And, and um, so I, I had to learn in, in that sense by teaching myself with guidance. There, there may be some, there may be a case for this online university thing. Um, thank you. And what I did find was that by paying attention to what I was doing, trying to find my way back to that flavor experience that my grandmother provided me with, and a focused interaction, you know, put it in, stir it around, smell it, watch it, listen to it you know, add something else, taste it, you know. Uh, I began to learn, you know, what types of actions had what types of effects. And I could see them on people's faces when the fork hit their mouth. Um, and so that is kind of what drives me as a chef. And in where I see these lifeless Creole dishes coming out of old restaurants in New Orleans, uh, I also get a sense that there's not that much cooking uh, going on in the homes. Um, you know, I feel that I have a couple of, you know, interesting things that I'm just simply got to read. Um, I feel that we're on a path to raising a generation of grandmothers that are not likely to create the kind of food memories that mine did. More and more, uh, we're buying Happy Meals and chicken tenders. And I want to talk to you about, uh, I'd like to read you then um, the opening paragraph of a, what I guess is a recipe that I've written uh, to make gumbo. Uh, a good gumbo can be as hard to pin down as an individual's personality. Although they are all generally drawn from the same array of ingredients, the list of them is long, and the process of layering them into the pot long and drawn out, as, the, as is the overall cooking time, which result in significant variations from one to the next. In the end, a gumbo will always fall somewhere along the spectrum of brown and color and spicy to taste. The subtleties and complexity and soul-satisfying intensity emerge wholly in the interactive hand of the cook and are almost impossible to pass from one to another through letters on a page. So here's my mind and I'm in Chicago watching the news, uh, watching the weather forecast uh, to see if uh, I'm going to make, if my flight back is going to get in early enough to get in in front of the storm. Like the day before the storm hit, I was actually still thinking about flying back there. I had seen a lot of fairly good sized hurricanes take a sharp left at the last minute and was trained like a lot of people to maybe not take that situation as seriously as I should. Uh, at that time, I didn't really know much about anything about Arkansas, with the exception of the black apple. Um, and my wife spent the next six weeks in that hotel room. Uh, I got out and found a way into New Orleans after three. And what I found was a city deserted, silent. There was no buzz of transformers. There was no white noise. There was not even the sound of bugs, not mosquitoes. Couldn't hear mosquitoes in New Orleans in the summertime. Crazy. 
Uh, plenty of helicopters, a few cars, occasional C-130. Um, I, uh, at the time, my wife and I were living in a complex, an apartment complex that was about two blocks away from where uh, Anderson Cooper was reporting uh, at the convention center. And we were under contract uh, in an area called Old Metairie uh, on a home that is, is on uh, one of the highest known ridges in the city. And I spent 10 days um, making round trips, holed up at my parents' house, uh, moving our stuff out of uh, our apartment. The complex didn't open for another two years due to, due to uh, structural damage to the parking decks. A thousand keys in this place. In 10 days, I didn't see another person while I was moving my stuff out. I could make one trip a day, 10 miles round trip, um, because of um, curfews, military checkpoints. I was traveling around with a 380 automatic on my side and a Xerox letter from a government official that said that whoever was carrying the paper was okay to be in town. The city was closed. Uh, I was able to close on the house. Uh, which required a sort of uh, enforcement of contract beyond the date due to extenuating circumstances. Uh, but it did not take long uh, for my wife and I to start considering getting out of town. Uh, we had a baby coming in five or six months, and a lot of things that we thought would be okay with us before we got into the business of having a child were no longer okay with us. And while New Orleans is what I would call a city that's poor but proud of itself, it was now facing an economy that was cut in half from there. Uh, I did not want to face the education opportunities in New Orleans. And the one thing that New Orleans really did have in a big way was violent crime. So when that call came in from Arkansas, it seemed like desperate enough times to come and see what it was all about. Uh, had it not been that tough, I may never have come to see. Um, I was in one of the world's great food towns uh, on a trajectory uh, that put me up through many, many well-known award-winning chefs, and that's just the track that I was on my first thought was that Arkansas would be effectively like falling off the face of the earth. So I came to see, and I saw a framework of, with Heifer International, the duck and rice capital of the world, a very significant contributor and in our agricultural prominence to the country. Uh, and inside that, I stumbled across Hardin's Mercantile Market, whatever he called his little stand in the, in the uh, river market. What was very unusual about Jerry Hardin's market stand was that in addition to his own family farms, products, and Grady, he was offering goat's cheese from Rogers, um, chickens, heritage chickens and pork uh, from Moralton, heritage lamb from Perryville, eggs from all over the place, raw milk cheese from Rosebud, uh, grains and flour freshly stone ground uh, from War Eagle, um, and dozens of others, including Peter Graves' uh, foray into farm-raised shrimp. And it became abundantly clear to me that Arkansas had a very incredible food story that was not recognized, it appeared, and not being told. Um, I would, explaining to somebody else, I, I guess, I would say that Arkansas kind of runs a spectrum 
between the Mississippi Delta to Appalachia. And what's goofy about that is that you can take that whole diagonal and turn it sideways, and then you find yourself from the Mississippi Delta in Arkansas to the Ozarks. Okay? Catfish, blues, pecans, sweet potatoes, collard greens, cracklings, black apples, walnuts. Cold water trout's kind of in between, and they may not be native, but it sounds good. <laughs> We're at a time that the country is fixated, or those of us, I think, that are, that are driving, that are, that are involved in, in a new direction uh, on localism, sustainability, hand craftsmanship, and nothing's hotter right now in, in my part of the food world than southern food. Arkansas offers, and it's, it's the only state that fully, from the low delta to the, to the, um, to the Warren Mountains, is the only state to me that, that has that to offer. And even where you may get a, a, a wide range of difference in Tennessee, that place is so friggin' long that you lose track of what's going on. <laughs> so it didn't take long um, for me to, to get the idea that, that Arkansas could become the poster child for American food and an antidote to its ailings. When I arrived in Arkansas, what I brought was not the Louisiana heritage that I was trying to preserve. I brought only my effort to preserve, not the food itself, but the philosophical approach to the identity of sense of place. Speaking of sense of place, where exactly is Arkansas? I mean, in describing its food, you have to call it, you know, Mississippi to North Carolina, to people that don't know. Um, and it's a fun, fun to debate idea um, with the, the uh, enthusiasm that we all have for the Razorbacks. I understand that Arkansas could be no place other, I guess, than the Southeast. Um, I find being west of the Mississippi River pretty easy to argue that. Uh, and I grew up in New Orleans, and you may know that for most of their history, the Saints were in the NFC West. Uh, with Los Angeles and San Francisco. So the Razorback, the SEC thing doesn't really work for me. Um, Oklahoma and Missouri kind of make things real confusing. So does the strange relationship with Dallas. If it was Houston, that might be different. Uh, Houston's kind of the west, western end of, of New Orleans, as, as I see it. Um, so it's, it's difficult to, to, to come up with a, you know, what, what I said that I wanted to do when I said I was going to come here is I was going to cook Arkansas food. And just like I was like, Arkansas, are you crazy? All the people here said, Arkansas food? Why would you want to do that? And, uh, well, I felt that it was something that needed to be explored. I felt that there was a story there and that it could be developed. And while there is no, and today, really, in a large degree, I still don't fully have the answer. But I think it's coming not to worry. Uh, and by that, I mean that the development of, of cuisine and culture is something that takes place over time. And, and it takes place um, by people um, paying attention to the, and celebrating what's around them, responding to their climate and to their seasons and to the products at hand. And there's, of course, also a blending of, of 
immigration and, and all the various different types of peoples that are in a place. And uh, in, in a context, uh, what I you know, will ex like to talk to you about a lot is that, is that America, in a lot of ways, isn't any further along in defining its food culture and its cuisine as, as Arkansas is. And, and we do have some, some spots that are well developed, and um, mostly we can thank the French for that. Uh, I believe that um, overall, really, America's too young to have a well-developed cuisine. Uh, and we think we have some pretty good ideas of Chinese, <laughs> Japanese, Italian. Uh, what we know about the, the, the food cultures of, of these other countries that are some of the closest um, to us are um, Americanized consolidations of broad slices of broad, regionalized, very, very well-defined food cultures over a very long time um, with comprised of a makeup of, some, in some cases, hundreds of, of small um, and, and different cultures. Um, in, the, in the case of Japan, uh, I've got a really abbreviated uh, helper up here. Um, Japan was, was these places all, Japan, um, China, and Italy, all have cultural roots and intermingling of varied peoples that go back to prehistory. They, they go back to BC. Um, Japan, in the 1860s, developed an idea that was essentially the study of Japan's national identity and its culture. And it was, in a lot of ways, a, a movement to shake a hundred years of, or a thousand years of Chinese um, influence. And they believed that, that there was a sort of inner Japanese trait that could be sifted out, uh, if it could be unwound. Um, Japanese Cuisine is based upon simple ingredients, uh, mostly around rice and noodles and a soup with, with accompaniment, side dishes to add flavor uh, made of fish and vegetables and tofu. And there's a focus on, intense focus on locality and seasonality and presentation which, you know, kind of amounts to labor, time, money. Um, it's, it's caring. You have to choose to do that. What they get for that is that all of America, or, you know, except for the ones that are scared of the raw fish, want to go to Japanese restaurants. Um, Chick-fil-A can do that here to its own people, but... Um, similarly, China, um, you know, millions of years, um, you can go back in China, uh, and the, ultimately the development of the Republic of China at the end of the final throw of the last imperial dynasty uh, was in, to a large degree, a reaction to the invasion of the West. Um, uh, but we know, we think that our idea of, of these other cultures in Italy is that what we know of their food is that it's a very general understanding. And from a distance, uh, and with so much confirmation from one restaurant to the next, uh, it's easy for us to believe that, that we know it and that we can summarize 
comfortably um, a generalization of these other nations. Faced with the challenge of uh, elaborating on them at a more granular level, regionally, I think that most of us will be stumped. Friuli from Liguria in Italy, I mean, can anybody speak on the differences of those two cuisines? I can't. Um, I can't even tell you the difference between Cantonese and Hunan. Um, Sichuan, that means it's spicy, I think. Um, on the other side, over here in America, um, we're totally, I, we're either naive or we're totally stumped uh, on a generalization of what American food is. Um, we can toss off examples. Barbecue, fast food. Um, Cajun, Creole, Southwest, Tex-Mex. Somebody came up with Floribian. Low country. Well, Cajun Creole cuisine were defined a long time before Southwest and Tex-Mex. And if you can put decades or a century in between those, then I argue that Arkansas has an opportunity to emerge down the line too. And in the context of today, where local, seasonal, sustainable, crafted, southern, is all the rage, I think our time is here. Uh, as I stated, you know, about the French, the, the British were very rejecting of the French and their food. They didn't want any part of it. And the French, in a sense, were kind of relegated to a couple of small spots. New Orleans, South Carolina, which I presume explains Charleston and Low Country. Uh, in the case of America, I think that many of us have heard that there was some Asian migration across the ice bridge through Alaska um, into the northern Pacific Northwest and around 12,000 or more uh, years ago. And we don't really know very much about them. Uh, the next thing that pops up are the, the Mississippian cultures that are the, essentially the, the root of our Native Americans. Uh, that doesn't come up until about the 800s. And six or 700 years later, when the Europeans came over, they didn't exactly assimilate themselves into the Native American culture. They didn't exactly take them in and force them to be a certain way. They were relegated to their own spots. Uh, so we have our prehistory folks that aren't contributing, and we have um, our native peoples that have something to show in today's American food, but um, not like we would not like took place in Italy. Uh, Italy is extremely varied. Uh, and it is got signature dishes that are being regionalized all across Italy. And there's, there's a, a unification in their food that's taking place in their country. Uh, so we're left to have our beginnings more or less um, with the discovery of the new world. That's not a very long time, you know, compared to what these other folks have had. Uh, then we're challenged with huge numbers of immigration, immigrants from, from all kinds of places that are able to have their own zones. So it's not like the deck is totally shuffled. Uh, we've got a very large country with lots of topographical variety, seasonal differences. 
So there's a whole lot of mess here to, to sort out before we can be able to establish our own identity. Uh, in addition, however, to the relative youth and the immaturity of a defined national cuisine, what's different about the U.S. in the context of these other nations is that they were all well-developed prior to the 19th century. We did not have all this sorted out prior to the Industrial Revolution. We went through construction and build out and into a series of wars and industrialization and more wars and straight to superpower status without stopping for lunch. And still today we eat in our cars. I think this is a big deal. Culture as an historical reservoir, an hourglass filled with colored sands, uh, the makeup of which represents contributing diversity in a gradual blending and intermingling of tradition. We have plenty of sand in almost every color, so to speak. Uh, but it's on the back burner, and it's one of the first places we choose to cut spending. By that, I mean culture, the arts. Um, what I think this is going to do for us is that we develop a sort of cultural integrated amnesia. Okay, and by that I mean we lose the ability to go back to the past. We still can create new memories that we can relate to going forward, uh, but we can't get back to that old stuff, uh, which I think is sort of the opposite of the way I understand Alzheimer's, uh, which is people can can get back, you know, they stop the ability to, to keep track of things that are happening now, but, you know, and it just goes older, you know, further and further back as, as there's erosion. Uh, and what's significant about that is that we've not had the centro, as you have a Mexican culture, or um, we don't have um, the same kind of community gathering places where you know we can kind of exchange our understandings of social norms uh, and we're today even abandoning that at the family table to a large degree uh, we're getting our information about who we are and how we should be from the internet and from reality tv superficial in its best there's nothing real about reality tv but, you know, I'm not so sure how clear, you know, 10 year olds are on that. And it's going to have a lasting impression on them. What's left is a hollow and ungrounded consumption, a mutation in cultural development. Now, this is important, I think, because that in letting go, of or failing to complete or to continue the pursuit of development of culture in America, we risk a great deal of potential financial benefit in terms of tourism and travel dollars. Culture and cuisine are primary drivers in tourism. They're the basis upon which a place is judged. They're the reasons that we travel to places that we travel to. A close look at any noteworthy food or cuisine will show that it's a cuisine of local relevance with a sense of place that's tied either to climate or tradition or both. Reliance upon a sterile corporate and gimmick-laden food service system not only sacrifices our own cultural identity, but it risks losing talent. A failure to, it offers a, fa it, 
is a failure to instill ambition and to create opportunity. Drive the Delta. Uh, oddly, as much time as I had in advance of the opening of the Capitol Hotel and where I thought I would tour the state, do laps around it, somehow never really got much further than Mountain View. Uh, but I made a lot of trips through the Delta, either to Greenwood, Mississippi to visit the Viking Cooking School or to uh, New Orleans. And all the time, I was looking for some iconic little country eatery to stop at along the way. They don't, they're not there. They've been replaced by Hardee's, Subway. Uh, you know, I, I view these businesses as sort of the carbon monoxide of individual economic prosperity. And by that, I say that because carbon monoxide attaches to hemoglobin in your cells so that there's no place for oxygen to go. And these places are taking our meals and taking up the place where other ones, others would be. And what happens is that in these Delta communities that have already died from the change in the cotton business and are dying more because of the imported catfish, uh, they lost businesses that were buying local products to be prepared and served there. Meanwhile, these other companies have sucked the money out and used, them, used it for television commercials and to build other shops in other small towns to result in the ending of more small mom and pop little businesses. And while they're little businesses, maybe in the grand scheme of the big money world, they don't matter they give those towns a sense of place. More and more today, there's no difference. They've, they've lost their differentiation. There's nothing to see. There is interest. We have the Southern Foodways Alliance uh, has developed in order to preserve and curate culture in this sense, has, has developed the, the Tamale Trail in which Rhoda's and Lake Village is well celebrated. Uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I, I stop there, half the time I stop there, they tell me about, am I with the news? They ask, are you, are you the news guy that's coming to do something today? No, I just want a tamale, you know? And, and they've got constant traffic because there is interest. And, and there's now developed um, a Budan Trail, a gumbo trail. And, and allows people to go and, and, and experience place and meet people that, that are you know, personally engaged and involved in, in what they do. It's their living, it's life, it's not just you know, getting to tomorrow. Uh, in a sense, the way I see this is that the development of food culture uh, across the bulk of America was deprived of its childhood. Uh, the Industrial Revolution, the two world wars, gave us uh, two income families, surrogate parenting, uh, and turned over the feeding of our children to commercial interests. We became a latchkey country. Um, what we are seeing today in America is very much a response to this. Efficiency made possible the, how do I, I get a little kind of nasty here, I gotta be careful. <laughs> um, we fell out of the Second World War, you know, with an infrastructure that could do almost anything 
a truckload of explosives that needed to find a new home. Uh, and the ability to develop the monoculture in the grain belt that allowed us to get involved in stockyard feeding and set the stage for the emergence of the fast food machine. At the time, there was nothing for would-be preservationists to try to preserve, except old ways of, and inefficient ways of doing things. Uh, because we're now a superpower, and we never did get that, our business taken care of in terms of, you know, developing our culture. Um, we're now too busy to do it. It requires us to choose expense. It requires master's degree students to drop out of their professions and start small organic farms and peddle things at farmers markets. These are the people that are doing that kind of thing today. You can't, I'm not, I don't know a whole lot about farming and I, and I, and I confirmed this summer that I'm not capable of growing anything in a garden. But I'm pretty sure that big ag has agricultural land at a price now where, you know, they're the only ones who can play. Uh, in, in a sense, our food culture, you know, never had religion before it was led astray. It doesn't know what to go back to. It doesn't know how to go back to. Um, the first visible response to this uh, was probably the hippies. Alice Waters, organic. Uh, it was cute, and they didn't smell good. And there was plenty more to their lifestyle that, that um, you know, made people want to choose not to listen to them. Uh, but they didn't go away. They might be driving BMWs today, but they put Whole Foods in our lap. However, not as widely recognized, in 1947, no surprise, immediately after the Second World War, was the formation of, or the beginning of Rodales. And that's really where the idea of organic farming began. That was, in the most idiotic of ways, a revolutionary idea in 1947, in spite of the fact that those principles and practices were already being employed right up through the First World War. Uh, but the proliferation of chemical fertilizers, pesticides, artificial ingredients, preservatives, and additives for taste and appearance in the years following World War II rapidly changed agriculture. Uh, the hippies were fueled by drugs and ideals. Our young parents today are energized by terrifying allergies to peanuts and gluten. And our children are plagued with obesity and diabetes. We are no longer enduring a fad. We are fighting a crisis. It is no longer about too much fat or too many carbohydrates. It's more about the nutritional quality and cleanliness of our ingredients. In 1986, the Slow Food Organization was formed in Italy as a direct response to America's greatest fast food icon invading an historical area in Bra. The purpose of slow food 
is to preserve traditional and regional cuisine and encouraging the farming of plant and livestock characteristic of the local ecosystem. It's the same stuff that Rodale's talking about. It's the same thing the hippies were talking about. It's the same thing that the Japanese were doing a thousand years ago. And so were all of the many factions that make up Italy. And it's insanity to me that, that these other places could create such an incredible and desired effect out of choosing to develop their own cultures, and we cannot beat it out of ourselves. It's, you know, it's very challenging. Um, it takes decades for Franken food to manifest itself. There's no cause and effect ability. It doesn't, you know, it's not like sticking your hand in the fire. And as long as, you know, you're not hungry anymore, what's it matter? It's just today. Don't forget about the Americans don't remember things for a very long time. And in the case of eating bad food, it takes about 12 hours. Um, you know, and they're already, they're in the lowest spots you can find in New Orleans, people are building houses. Okay. Um, so, but we're feeding tons of people really cheaply. This flipped. What's available to us, or, or people to eat today, has is, is become inverted. It, where it would have been that, that pâtés and sausages and things that took time and effort and talent to make were for the aristocracy. They were, that was for the wealthy, you know. The, the, the poor people just ate plain vegetables out of the ground and, you know, and cuts of meat that were either boiled until they fell apart or, you know, charred. And now, you know, slow food organization has been accused of being elitist because it simply costs more to create food that has nutrition in it that's not dirty than it does to package chemicals that take up space in your stomach and give you all kinds of ugly diseases. So, but we're getting lots of people fed. You know, have, have we put a premium on cultural identity or have we prostituted it out? The system now is too big to fail. Nobody can, what happens if, um, you know, Cargill's and, and um, McDonald's, all these people die, you know, they fail. They take most of, a lot of retirements with them. Um, you know, the ramifications of unwinding these machines is pretty ugly. It's right about as ugly as detoxing from heroin, I would think. You know, it's a junkie's path. And the problem is that it's the thing that, that sustains us and keeps us going is the thing that's going to kill us eventually. As long as it makes us feel better today, we must be doing, must be okay. We'll do it to fix it tomorrow. Um, along the same kind of timeline, you know, th there's a lot of notice today that Michelle Obama has installed a garden in the White House. Guess what? So did John Adams, second president. There's been gardens in the White House from John Adams through the First World War, maybe even until the Second World War. Um, one of the last uh, of note, I think, was Eleanor Roosevelt that got some press. Um, Jimmy Carter denied it. 
The Clintons wanted to have a garden on the grounds of the White House, and they were told no. So they put one on the roof. <laughs> True. 1945-67 is, is the point where we left home. 1947 is when Rodale came forth. Uh, it took, you know, another 20 years for the hippies to, to hit their level, another 20 years for Whole Foods. But what's come out of that, you know, it, this isn't going away, it's growing, thank goodness. Uh, farmers markets were kind of cute. They used to happen on Saturday. Now they're all over the place. Not only that, they're online. Um, this is good. You know, what it proves is that it's not molecular gastronomy. Okay, it's not dipping dots. Believe me, that's not going to last. Um, choosing to put money into wholesome foods um, is only difficult the first time. It's kind of like choosing to switch from dial-up to high-speed internet. It's kind of like choosing to switch from regular to high-definition television. Um, it's very easy to say that maybe it doesn't really matter. That's not that big of a difference. I mean, you know, nutrition, minerals, vitamins, healthy things are no easier, really, to pick up chewing on a yard bird than they are sniffing a container of carbon monoxide. It's just you can't detect it. It's possible. But it does taste better. And I'll bet I can find a lot of people that will make a case for An, a production, an industrial chicken, saying it's not that big of a difference, still willing to pick sides on Coca-Cola versus Pepsi. Or I had another good one. The punchline was um, was uh, cheese dip, local dinner, Mexico chiquito. The point is that we care, and. Once we've been exposed to something better, it's very difficult always for us to go back. Um, I mean, the state of response to what's going on in food today, we're seeing celebrity farmers pop up behind celebrity chefs. Restaurants are coming out with names like Revival. There's one that just opened in, Re in New Orleans called Revolution. And it's not revolution. It's R apostrophe evolution. So it's not evolution. It's like re-evolution. And where we got involved with artisan old world bread baking a while ago, we're now seeing a proliferation of cheese making, preserving, curing. There's more charcuterie out there today than I think I can stand. Um, I think it's a path, you know. It, it's, it, it's a path for chefs who, a young chef today, is fighting his way or her way out of this sterile world. I had a guy that I cooked with at Restaurant August in New Orleans. He was probably 23 or 24 years old, and he was working the grill, and he was cooking. He happened to have the steak dish, which in a fine dining restaurant means that it was a filet. And um, after probably six or eight months or more, he had his first experience with a server bringing a steak back that the customer wasn't satisfied with. And not that the outside and the inside are any different, you know, when they're raw. Um, the steak was cut open, and he looked up and he said, that's the first time I've ever seen the inside of a filet. 
He had been cooking these things for months. And somehow, once the outside of it was seared brown, the inside was something different, you know? But on the one hand, learning to temp a filet to whatever the customer specification is, and sometimes it's like, well, kind of in between medium rare and medium. Okay. You, you have to cook a few. You have to put them in the oven. You have to do the little, you know, squish them test or, you know, stick the little um, wire in there and, and check it to heat. But even when you test the heat, you still have to cut them open, you know, to see what that heat means. What does it look like when it feels like that? What does it look like when the wire's out and warm? And this kid was just killing it with cooking the steaks and, and you know, forever and ever. Uh, it just blew my mind that, you know, he grew up on bunny bread, wonder bread, and didn't have any exposure, but here he is in New Orleans putting out some of the best foods the town's got. I thought that was pretty interesting. So, I found Arkansas to be a really obvious place to lever this uh, national movement in a lens uh, by which to illustrate that fancy, coveted things are often simple, humble, local things in another place to other people. The difference is that they're appreciated and celebrated because they are cared for and they're crafted in an artisan fashion. One of my favorite examples of this as I've tried to explore what it, Arkansas food is, is um, caviar from the paddlefish. Spoonbill caviar um, comes out of the Mississippi River, White River, Tennessee River. Uh, in this case, what I was buying was, was coming out of the Mississippi and the White River. And it's, um, it's pretty mild. I mean, it's kind of, you know, good caviar for people that are afraid of it. Because cheap caviar isn't that good. Um, you get the Russian stuff for $250 an ounce. You don't get the, you know, if I'm not going to have that, I'm not going to get the black caviar, the American sturgeon caviar. I want the paddle fish rope. And price involved, I'll just take the paddle fish rope. You can have that other stuff. Uh, traditionally, it's eaten with all kinds of stuff anyway. Onions, buckwheat pancakes. Buckwheat pancakes, like freshly milled to order from War Eagle Mill. Creme fraiche, clotted cream. Okay, well, now we've got the fare of European kings and queens. We're pulling it out of the water and out of the field behind us here in Arkansas. So, it's, it's perception. You have to choose to, to get involved. We have to be able to, to recognize what's around us. We have to go out and support the local restaurants. Um, it's a very difficult proposition to set up shop here. We cannot get people out of the Red Lobsters. And, you know, I'm willing to accept the Chick-fil-A thing. But the Red Lobsters and the Outbacks and the Golden Corrals, I really, although I entitled this Breaking the Chain, it's very much not about um, chain restaurant bashing. It's more about a, a pattern that we're in. Um, you know, the, the um, Times, I think, or the Arkansas Business puts out a, a listing of, you know, the top 20 or 25 um, A&P tax receipts uh, in both North Little Rock and Little Rock. And guess what? They're in a local independent company on there. Not one. Not one.
So back to this, Mrs. Arkansas. We have one of the longest growing seasons you could want. We have some of the best dirt you can get. We have a whole lot of space. Um, and we have good old fashioned, you know, pastoral heritage. It's very easy for simple food to be prepared by carrying hands so that they lose the blandness of the can and the burn of the freezer. Cracklins. I'll get back to cracklins. Um, we have um, still some challenges. I, at the farmer's market uh, last year, I, was, I get really excited about right now because the grapes start coming out of Altus. And um, my favorite grapes in the whole world are the uh, Mars grapes. Um, and here I am buying up a bunch of Mars grapes and the farmer is telling me how excited he is that he's, he's expecting some seed company to get him a hybridized version that'll have a thinner skin and it'll be um, crunchier, just like the ones at Kroger. And I thought, that's terrible. <laughs> But our challenges in Arkansas are bigger than the homogenization of grapes. We lack um, a, a culturally attuned labor to, to get this thing off the ground. And, and I'll, I, if I can find my way back to the labor problem, I, um, I have more to say about that. Um, and, Oh, I'll say it now. What we have the problem is that these big chains are paying people in a sense to not know how to cook. And they're paying them more money to not cook than somebody who will teach them to cook can pay them. And so then they're not going out into the world as consumers of the local food culture. We have what one of my colleagues once um, probably relayed a story, but he called um, rubophobia. And there's this strange kind of fear of being perceived as not knowing the finer things. And people would rather choose what they know than to be caught out of their comfort zone which I would say is kind of like not choosing not to you know, take dancing lessons or something like that when you're a teenager and spend the rest of your life not being able to do that what those other people are doing. Um, we lack a sufficient and steady flow of visitors. An ample and embedded local market that's ready and willing to support this development. It's, I don't mean that, that it's not there, you know, and I, I certainly don't have any business talking like that to anybody that's in here. I know that, with the exception that you know, we can probably find a lot of places to agree. Um, and, you know, because we don't have, you know, the, the critical mass or, the, or it hasn't really developed, we don't have the kind of tourism that we need. We don't really have the platform by which to broadcast the message. You know, the cameras aren't looking at us. That's one of the reasons that nobody knows anything about Arkansas. Um, so our renewed interest in creating culture and defining our place in the world has become the academic pursuit and the cutting edge of cuisine today. Chefs are not looking for all white meat factory chickens. Yeah. Could you imagine that? If, if they could 
figure out how to engineer an all-white meat bird. <laughs> and if the breeders could figure out how to house those things with four wings, no bones, you know. Um, I think they'd be all over it. And that's what we'd have. And there'd be inner city kids that think that chickens don't have bones. And guess what? They'd come to be right. And we wouldn't have stock <coughs> if we didn't have those bones. And if we didn't have stock, we wouldn't have chicken noodle soup. And if we didn't have chicken noodle soup, we wouldn't have an ex a known experience, a feeling, a memory that creates a pleasure and a healing that inspires the title of a book about nurturing the soul. Combined with freshly picked green beans and some handcrafted con smoked bacon, this chicken stock can transport you to your youth. If not that, your grandmother's youth. And provide you with a sensory memory to be transported to the next time one that you can share as an affection to family and friends and strangers in need. This is where I have tried to place Arkansas cuisine. It is a journey forward as much as a historical past. It's kind of French provincial, really, and a little Italian, too. This story is about love and family and stewardship and responsibility. It's about culture and life's simple pleasures. It was all that was available to our forebears, and we need it to be known to our progeny. We need to bring back slap your mama good food. <laughs> Not just in the restaurants, but also in our homes and in our schools. This means cooking by hand with heritage and heirloom ingredients that are both clean and wholesome in a deliberate manner with care for people for whom we care about. Stepping backward is our path to moving forward. Finding our way back to that original plate of granny beans no new twist, no fancy gourmet, whatever, whatever. Back to where we were before the tradition was tradition, to pre-tradition. A return to historically relevant cultural preservation with the assist of our most modern capabilities. That is what I have called new Americana cuisine. And that is my recipe for Arkansas food. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Lee, for that. Uh, we do have time for just one or two quick questions, and before I turn it over to y'all, I want to know what probably a lot of these people are thinking. Uh, what, what's next? Where are you going to be? What, what's in the future of, of Lee Richardson? Um, I was hoping you might be able to tell me about that. I've got some ideas. You do? Yeah. I mean, they're okay. not good, but I, mean, I got some. Well, um, you know, I uh, when I came here, uh, I, I looked at what, what um, I felt like I needed to do. I had a pretty, pretty interesting challenge um, trying to do what I did at the Capitol Hotel. Um, and like I said, I thought that we lacked um, some media. I thought that we lacked um, some of the tourism that we need. I thought that we lacked um, some labor. 
that was skilled in this area. I mean, you know, I feel that when, when kids want are watching the chefs on TV, they want to go to the Culinary Institute of America, or they want to go work for Daniel Ballou in New York. Uh, so I felt that uh, it was critical to um, build a facility that could offer a one-stop shop, end-to-end -end training uh, for people that really want to cook. Uh, that would um, have a story that would invite media, um, that would be a destination place. We built a kitchen uh, that we invite all the, we invited, I, the customers are invited uh, to go into uh, and, to, and to, to see what it's about. Um, it took all of those elements and I'm kind of um, stuck on that kind of thing, you know. I'm, after doing that, uh, I determined that I needed to do it for myself. Um, and I think I did a good job for the hotel, and, and uh, um, I think that I, I was able to contribute uh, to the community, and I'm not sure that my work here is finished, uh, and I still feel um, an obligation, in a sense, to continue. Uh, to contribute in that way to this community. And uh, if I do end up doing that, then I will probably like to try and sort of transpose the whole model in a sense, is that I would like to get my hands into the food industry at um, many different levels. And I'm more interested in um, here, and really anywhere for that matter, um, I'm not interested in, in opening up the next French Laundry. Um, I'm interested in creating jobs and training people and selling Arkansas to its own people, the rest of the country and the world. Um, it's, it's a challenge uh, to do business here. Uh, I'm uncertain whether my following will, I can, survive still. Um, the numbers that those um, Olive Gardens put up are, are pretty uh, discouraging. Um, but I'm looking, you know, but every time you find a different building, it, it may cause you to tailor your, your idea. I'm pretty flexible. You know, if I'm gonna, I can do fried chicken. I can do sandwiches. I can do tasting menus, you know, and I intend to, to try to do all of these things. Um, but the short answer of, you know, what am I doing now? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, whatever the next thing is that happens, it'll be my own business. Whether or not it's here, you know, I, I'm looking here and I'm looking in other places and um, I've got a few, you know, different events that I'm doing. Um, in places that keep me just distracted enough that, um, you know, two weeks can go by and not a whole lot of progress can be made pretty easily. Yes, sir. One second. Wait for this mic. So, so you talk pretty elegantly about cuisines from France and um, from Italy. What about some of the smaller areas where we've had waves? What do you see as the place for, you know, masses from Eastern Europe or the Levant and the con contributions they've made? And what happens as those waves start building on each other and more people come in? I think, um, well, first of all, I'm probably completely ignorant when it would come to, to speak of much on that, but I think that, that anything that comes in um, is, is good news and it's a good place to learn. And, and I think that our interest in you know having a new culture um, come in and get involved is going to be directly related to how much we really know about it, and so ignorance can really get in the way. Um, I don't know if I've if I've answered that. I know very little about Eastern European cuisine other than some of those sausages. Uh. Hi. Um, my question, I have two quick questions. One would be, are you considering work, writing a cookbook? Um, you know, when I f 
first left the hotel a couple of months ago, um, I began trying to write some of my stuff down. You know, because of the way that I cook, um, I, don't, I don't really work with recipes um, as much as I should when it comes time to decide that I wish I had a cookbook written. Um, when, I, when I write a recipe, it's very, very, very deeply thought through. It comes with a small paragraph of, you know, context. Um, and writing a cookbook for me, then, is probably going to be something that accumulates slowly along the way until I've got enough material. Um, and, you know, that's obstacle one, and who would buy it is uh, obstacle two. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm encouraged. And the second thing is, is, you know, you must probably could open anywhere, bring in the Leinheimer's bread and fried shrimp and a good bowl of gumbo, and I think you'd have more of a following than you realize. Well, you know, the new, pulling the New Orleans trick out of my pocket is, is always there. Last one. There have been wine producers in the state of Arkansas for well over 100 years. But today, if you go to a local restaurant, you'll find wines from California, Washington, Oregon, France, Italy, Spain, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. You will n never find a, a wine right from here in Arkansas on their wine list. Whose fault is that? Is it the that fault of the winemakers? Are you in the wine business? No. Well, it, <laughs> not not in selling to restaurants, but I, I really think it's a disgrace the lack of support for Arkansas winemakers that the Arkansas restaurant industry has been. Is it the fault of the winemakers, the Department of Agriculture, or the fault of the Hospitality Association? And and what can be done to turn that around? Um, well, I'm I'm not. Um, is anybody here grow grapes in Arkansas? Okay. Um, I'm not um, real sure exactly where the problem is. I don't know if, um, you know, the, the winemakers are still trying to figure out, you know, which, which um, clones to put on which rootstocks and or whether it's just the dirt or whether, um, you know, the climate. There are a lot of variables in, in successfully growing quality uh, wine grapes that the public is going to want. Uh, I, at the Capitol Hotel, and, and, and you know, where I've made a big point in, in celebrating promoting Arkansas, um, you know, I've had to struggle with um, choosing when to choose to and when to choose not to. Um, and in order for me to, to continue um, to, to have a validating assertion, I need to be careful about what I choose. And I, um, have only, I really haven't come across a, an Arkansas wine that um, got my attention. I've had some that um, the, the tasting experience was downright lousy. Um, there's one that, you know, is hard for me to turn around and, and try to... There, there's one whose story I've gotten behind, and it's a, it's a goofy pink sweet wine um, made by a Post family that, um, it, as a wine, I wouldn't want any part of it. But compared to a French aperitif, called Lillet, um, which I like um, on the rocks with a slice of orange, this, uh, this one sweet wine from Altus, um, I thought made an interesting um, substitution. Uh, but it's a t it's a t uh, the, 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 the winemakers here have um, an uphill battle. You know, and to explain, if it's, I'm sure it's abundantly obvious, but I can draw a corollary where I went down to New Orleans and I was cooking um, red beans on a stage to a crowd about this size, and somebody walked in and looked down at the sign and said, guy from Arkansas is cooking red beans? He doesn't know what he's doing. And he walked out. And he didn't know that I spent, you know, 30 years 
growing up in New Orleans. <laughs> um, and so th there's a, you know, there's a stigma, there's a promotion, there, there, there's a quality thing. It's, it's Um, yeah, um, it's, if we're not showing a, a product that, that fits in a, in a, in a world-class arena, in a sense, then it, it may be better not to show it until we have it. That would, that would, that's what I would do. And I, I don't have any objection to sitting down and trying every single wine produced in Arkansas. And if, if they don't work for me, then I won't promote them to the public because I don't want people seeing anything that's not gonna turn them on because it's hard enough to get them in here as it is. Well, Lee, thank you so much for uh, sharing all that thank with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>